Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode of the Airbnb Nomads podcast with me, Alex, alongside the main man, Mr. Pooh. And on this week's Property Education Masterclass, we are joined by the incredible Ray Smith. Now, Ray is a world-renowned mental health expert, business coach, time management specialist. There is so much in this episode, everything from how to communicate with people, how to manage your time, how to keep your mind sharp. You do not want to miss this episode. There is so much in here that's going to help you build your business and also lead a much healthier and happier life. So stay tuned. Personally, I could have spoken to Ray for hours, but we had to end it somewhere. Enjoy this episode. Suck up as much information and knowledge from this as you can. Believe me, it's going to be worth it. Here we go. So Ray, we, we wanted to have you on. Um, we've, we work together personally, right? Um, we, mm-hmm. you know, Ray's helped me immensely with all kinds of things around mental health. We've spoken about, you know, on the, in the Facebook community and, you know, other, other areas about, you know, how we've both been through the ups and downs of life, the hurdles, the challenges, the ups and the downs, so we've worked together. That's how we got to know each other through, you know, just general overall wellness. Yeah. Um, but not only the self-confidence, the self-esteem, setting up boundaries, basically becoming the best person that we can with the tools that we've been given. But also on top of that, we've spoken about business. We've spoken about time management. We've spoken about how to structure your business in order to maximize growth and, and, and time. So it's really been amazing. I've picked up so many tips from you and obviously moved forward immensely in our own business. So that's why we wanted to have you on to kind of bring all that knowledge and, you know, that wealth of knowledge that you've accumulated uh, to our audience. So, so I guess, why don't we start first with a little bit about you? Mm-hmm. How long have you been in the space? Have you always done this work? How did you get into it? Is it because you're so passionate about it or like, how did it kind of evolve? So, a little okay. bit about you, I guess. Well, I actually studied my psychotherapy diploma back in 2005, so 18 years ago. So I've been in that space for that amount of time. Before that, I had my own businesses as a wholesale agent over here in WA. And I had to give that up to move up here to Geraldton with my husband for his work. So that meant I needed to look for something else. And I had done my psychotherapy, but I wasn't using it. I started using it and then went off in another direction. But somehow it pulled me back. And I had people just out of the blue calling me saying, you know, are you still doing it? Can I have a session? And as it as it happens, it just kind of draws you back to where you should be. And I am passionate about it and um, really passionate about mental health and well-being. And eight, when I did do my diploma, it was, I think, I don't know, a long time ago, 18 years ago. But in that time, I've done a lot more studying. I love to study the way we work as humans. And I've done EFT, which is emotional freedom technique. So I'm certified in that. I've done my hypnotherapy as well. I'm certified in that. EMDR, the eye movement, I've, I've done my certificate in that. So all of that, can, and I before I did start of doing this, I was also studying kinesiology. So I have an idea of how the body and the brain all work, why we do what we do, and it just constantly intrigues me, constantly. Um, I'm always learning, always learning from my clients. And I guess for myself, why... I'm so passionate about it, is in 88, 1988, I lost my father to a sudden boating accident. And he was a crazy fisherman and loved to take his boat out. And when he retired, every Friday, his brother and himself would go fishing. And one day they didn't return and they had been hit by King Wave and drowned, both of them. And that was such a shock. I was a young mum. I had two young boys. I I was 27, 28 at the time, and I I was distraught. I had to look after two boys as well as grieve my father 
And that was a really, really tough time. So I started searching for answers. How do I get through this? What can I do? And I think it takes sometimes the loss of a job, the loss of someone special, an illness. It could take a breakup where we want to reach out and get the help that we need. And that was my beginning of my journey where I then studied kinesiology, went on to do my psychotherapy and um, tried to dig myself out of my grief and my because I was spiraling down into a depression and my friends were saying, you, you, know, you haven't got that sparkle, what's happened, where are you? And I didn't see it, but they saw it. So I had to do something about it yep. and did my own counselling and went, you know, got some help. Um, meditation, I'm a meditation facilitator. That's something that I did for many, many years and I still do off and on. And it's one thing that I think I always say it saved me because it allowed me to really journey inward to myself and get to find the answers that I needed and find that stillness and that peace that I was struggling with outside of that in just coping with, I'm a young mum, two children, husband and, and everything else that goes with that. So um, my journey began. Wow. Mm. Ray, you just said something like super, super important. Um, when you said, you know, when you you have like you spiraling down the depression yeah. route, yeah. Um, do you find it quite often that people don't actually no. know that they're spiraling down? No. What happened? Um, because with all the things that's happening around them, yeah. uh, it happens to me as well. Yeah. Like, you know, you're just so busy, you're caught up in everything and yeah. then you just kind of forgot where you were and then yeah. where you're heading, you have no idea. Absolutely. And the next thing you knew, you know, your, your emotion was so low and you know, everything's all negative yeah when um, i started noticing it when i would do what i had to do meaning i would do what i needed to do with my sons i would get the house clean i would do what i needed to do but then i didn't want to do anything else i didn't want to leave the house sometimes i didn't want to take the phone calls back then it wasn't mobile phones it was the you know old yeah. landline and i that would ring and i would run from it so i started to realize that this isn't right. And that's when my friend said, you're not the same. Why don't you want to come out? Why don't you want to, you know, come and play netball? Why don't you want to do the things you normally do? And sometimes if you don't have a really good group of friends that are noticing that with you, you can get into your own hall and shut that door and people don't even know you're in that dark state. You just go out, mm -hmm. do what you have to do, come back and you shut the door. So it's a, mm. it's a, I think something that we need to have really good friends and people that really care and know us well for them quite often to mm. pick up on that. We don't notice. No. Yeah. I guess that's the toughest part, isn't it? About, about depression and there's various, I'm obviously no expert, you're the expert, but from what I can understand, there's very, very different, different levels sense, of depression. Yeah. It's a very broad term mm -hmm. and depression mm -hmm. can range from anything of just being kind of generally down yeah. on a day to day basis, yeah. Yeah. you know, very at the very minor end, you know, the weather or it's grey today, I just feel a bit kind of draggy yeah. right to the other end of the spectrum where you're, you know, and then I guess you're at a point where you're you're in such a bad, dark place yeah. that you're not even capable of reaching out for the help. No. So that's when someone else has to notice it and step in yep. and, and try and guide you towards trying to get that help. But that once you get to that level, how do you pull that person? How do you save that person when they don't want to ask for help? They don't want to reach out for help. I mean, that's they, and the, the suicide rate, as we know, especially in men, has gone off the charts Absolutely. Uh, throughout the world. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So how do you how do you help someone like that? What's the. How do you access them when they're in such a dark place like that, you can, you, which can happen to any of us? Absolutely. You don't leave them. The, I've read a lot of books, and the one thing, I read a book about a young guy who was, I think, about 19. I'm not sure of the age, but around 19. He was only a young guy but was suffering depression. He went to the um, doctor, and the doctor put him on antidepressants, and the antidepressants he was put on, actually have side effects like they do. One of the side effects which he didn't realise and was not made aware of was it decreases your sexual drive 
and for a 19-year-old boy, that's a big thing. He just thought when all his mates were talking about this girl, that girl and what they were doing, that he was odd. He didn't. He did not link that the tablets he was taking was actually hindering that. I'm, I will get back to your question, but I was just thinking when he, yeah. when I read this book about depression, he was saying that um, it, he caught up years later in his twenties. I think it was about twenty-four, and he just had a really low sex drive. That's all he thought. I just have a very that's me, and he caught up with this other guy, and he was had been on these same tablets and he had been depressed and when he had said oh I'm on those tablets he said get off them as quick as you can because are you finding that you have no urge no sexual urges it's really low and this guy in his book said he could have cried he did not know that that was why he felt the way he felt he thought he was odd so he did get off them and he started to research and he went around the world and started interviewing people that had depression and one thing he came across, a common denominator, and that was lack of community, lack of support, lack of people around that was Huge. that was causing the depression. And there was one instance where he went to an African village and these women there were all depressed, so he wanted to find out what had changed. And these women used to take all their washing every day down to the, the uh, river and the rocks and all stuff sit around doing their washing, talking about how bad their husbands are, all that sort of thing, and the kids are driving them crazy. Uh, and then they'd go home. And this guy came along and said, "Why? what's changed? Why are you all so depressed now? And they said that. And it was a washing machine that actually had electricity bought in and a washing machine into all the, their village. And they no longer gathered. They no longer shared. They no longer spoke. So they were all in their own little huts, not needing to go out and do that anymore. And what was happening is they were all becoming really lonely and isolated from each other. So he, like with, with all his research and interviewing, he found that that was the number one denominator. So to answer your question in a long-winded way, um, how do you help someone? Be there. Don't let them be alone care ring you know the the adage of are you okay the symbol are you okay check in on them are you okay if they're not coming out or that you notice there's a change in them go around there sit with them you don't even have to talk but just let them know you're there and do you think that that, that sometimes that gets missed because the world now is such a busy place right everyone's head down phones on yeah. you know, in that zone that yeah. sometimes, and people are scared to kind of open up. Yeah. So just the idea of going to someone and saying, hey, like, do you want to talk? Are you okay? You know, this seems like, like even that most basic thing doesn't really happen these days, does it? It it's does. It's just like no. rush, 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 work, 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 family. Alex, family. I think it's it's a bit of a reverse psychology in the way it's almost like when you go, you go into a shop and, you know, let's say, for example, I don't know, like a Nike store or something. And you look, you look, you're you looking at these uh, brand new sneakers and then you've got a, a salesperson coming towards you. Like, can I help mm. you? If she asked that question, most automatically you'd be like, no, yeah. I'm good. Yeah. You walk out the store. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't know. It's just a strange thing. What, why is, why is that happening a lot these days? Are we like so rejected by, by everything, do you, do you know, or we don't even want to start a conversation these days. No. And um, I think what it is is we text a lot. We do communication via to, reading it ourselves. We're not our our yep. voice is getting lost. Our stories are getting lost, mm -hmm. and we're not sharing enough by picking the phone up. I, the amount of times that I have phoned people, especially, and I don't mean this, but younger ones that just text. They don't yep. like to talk on the phone, and I will leave a message on the phone when they don't answer and say, "Call me back." you know, just need to talk to you about a few things. They will text me back and say, what is it that you need, Ray? I don't do phone calls. And I was like, you don't do phone calls? And so I, and I hate the texting, you know, you text so long, I'd rather just talk and hear your voice. So exactly. I think that that's been a major problem. But one thing I really- So it's the human connection. The human connect, this, this, what we're doing now, the, the speech, the speaking, the hearing, someone's yep. voice um that this holds power 
Our voice holds power. And when people hear it, they feel who you are. I can't feel who someone is by text because your messages, I, I watch people do it. They will script it out and then they'll delete and get it perfect. So we keep presenting this perfect image of ourself in text. When we're doing this, we can stuff it up. We can get it wrong. And so people don't want to present that anymore. They, they, they don't want to get it wrong. So texting is much easier because they can script it. But so does that just come back to the fear of being rejected and, and doing things wrong? Yeah. Right. Okay. And the one thing that I will say is that my clientele, over probably the last five years, I have noticed it's gone from 80% women to, to 20% men. It's done a flip. It's now, mm -hmm. I would say, maybe 75% men and 25% women. And the men are usually in the age bracket of around 30 to 50. And mainly I'm getting a lot of 30 odd year olds, 40 year olds, because they're at a point, this is my take, they're at a point where they just don't know what to do anymore with women. They don't know with dating has changed. They don't know how to get it right with dating. There's all these conditions and rules. They're very confused and they, they need to talk to somebody. So I'm finding a lot of men now, thank goodness, are reaching out and doing a lot of counseling, a lot of therapy, just to, to understand and offload. Yeah. And that's a great thing. Right. That's, that's, I'm what do you think about this theory, which kind of interests me? There's, a, there's been such a huge shift in generational differences, yeah. right? Of who we are now, yeah. what, the, what, what, the, what, the, what this generation is like compared to what our, even my parents and their parents, I mean, it's changed so much. For example, I've been to my father before with things that in my mind, in my world, are a big deal yeah. right and i'm like oh dad you know i don't know what to do about this or that and he literally i mean not literally he didn't actually slap me but he's like come on son <laughs> like get on with it brush yourself yeah, off no. and get on with it yeah. you know it's yeah. like uh and my, and my mum's the same you know mm. she's like you know my mum's been through so much stuff she's rock solid she just keeps moving forward you know she's like very matter of fact do you think that what why is it now that we all have these supposedly have these issues i'm not i'm not sitting here saying mental health is not real depression is not real 100 percent it is but do you think to a certain level now we've kind of been we're kind of we, it's just very easy to turn around and go oh you know poor me i need help you know i need or is it or is it a generational thing or is it a consequence of like our surroundings that have changed or is it just that we're we're just weaker these days like the people that are being created look at the people that were like like going over the trip like normandy and the, like the beach landings all that kind of stuff can you imagine that happening today like the the people in it just wouldn't it was a tough it was a tougher kind of person back then yeah right i don't think would you agree with that or not look i think that there are it's different but there are many factors to consider environment is one what we're eating is another um what's being put into our food and on our food is very different um so there's that to consider which would impact but also i i hear what you're saying because i had that same gender parents the same where you, you know like yeah, yeah. mom i'm sick i don't want to go to school today and she would say she would send me to school and I'd be crying. I'd be so, so I really was sick, but she would say, it's mind over matter. Don't be silly. Get on the bus. Off you go. And I would be so sick. I'd be in the sick bed at school. But she just couldn't have it that you were not, you know, couldn't kind of use your mind to get over that. So I don't know whether it's that we're um, weaker for myself, looking at the generation now in their 20s, 30s that are coming through. It blows my mind. I'm in awe of them because... What they're achieving is what I and my husband have had to work, you know, 30, 40 years to achieve. But it's what is accessible now. When I was going through the death of my husband, there was not the such thing as I'd go see a counsellor, go get help. I went to the doctor and they don't really want to, they don't have the experience to help you in the capacity I needed. So there, we have so much more available to us now that 
we can get help and it's spoken about so freely back in the day like your parents day my parents day and even myself to an, a certain extent growing up if you had a problem with your mental health it was frowned upon it was like oh you know you just don't tell people everything had to be brushed under the carpet and you don't talk about it mm. Um, also, Pooh, like for myself, having an Indian husband and seeing the cultural difference with the way they handle, um, my husband's ha handle things. They don't, they're not affectionate. They don't say I love you. They don't, you know, they don't, or with the, not all, but my husband's family were uh, very different to my family. And so I think things have changed now where guys in particular, males in particular, are much, they're they're hands-on dads, you know, they are doing as much work as the women. The women are working, you know, and many years ago the women didn't work. So it's a lot of different, a lot of variables that you need to consider as to why. The other thing is we talk, we have social media, we have people talking about things so much more. So we're not afraid anymore to, to talk about it. We see it and it becomes normal. Back in my day, it wasn't normal. Back in your parents' day, Alex, it wouldn't have been normal. My parents' day, you just didn't talk about things like that. You got on with that. Well, I think, I think my, you know, because my, my father, you know, my father grew up in absolute unimaginable poverty, mm -hmm. like in a one-bedroom flat with eight siblings, you know, they'd all share a bag of chips for yeah. dinner, right? So for me to go to him and be like, oh, dear, yeah, it's like... What the hell? What the hell's wrong with you? Yeah. You've got nothing to complain about. You've got a nice house. You drive a brand new car. You go on holidays. Da 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 da. So for him, he's like, it doesn't, it doesn't compute. Yeah. Right. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. And uh, and I'm sure people that live in countries that are war torn and you know, you know, they're looking at us like, yeah. how can you be depressed? How can you be upset? How can you be sad? Yeah. So it's all kind of relative, isn't it? It's to... environmental factors, absolutely, and our conditions that we're used to. It's when you go to any you know, country, I did go back to India, and I, when I was there, the children over there that were orphaned and had nothing, we went to a lot of the schools, they were so happy. They would just come running, and they were just happy that they had visitors. And you look at that, and that's what they know, and that's all part of us as humans is... We, what we know, it becomes our familiarity. And because we are creatures of habit, it becomes quite habitual for us. We create habits and our behaviour out of that. And in doing that, you know, that their happiness is so different to our happiness. And our children are, again, different. You know, they have a different environment, different set of rules. So their happiness is determined by what they're used to or what they're being exposed to. It sounds like we are, I guess, I mean, this day and age, we are chasing pennies, shiny pennies the whole time. Yeah. You know, yeah. We're trying to, I don't know, um, keeping up with the Joneses yeah. for, for most families that I can, I can see around, around me. Yeah. And, and, um, and they're not happy. Well, so. It's really funny because when my husband and myself were, we've been together since we we're 17, since high school. And when we wanted to buy our first house, we were only young and we'd bought a block of land together and we were paying it off with our first jobs. And then we bought, we went and saw this house we loved in the in a really beautiful beachside area. And my sister lived there, so I wanted to be near my sister. And we walked in, we were talking to the real estate agent and we were very young now when I think about it. I think we were only about 21, 20, but we weren't married. So we would have been around 21, 22. And the real estate agent said something to me that stuck. He, at the end, as we're walking out, he goes, I can't get over you, young ones. Now, I'm going back when I was 21. And he said, you want to start where your parents finished. Your parents had to work very hard to afford a house like this, but you want to start here. And I, like, I walked out and I sat in my car and it really had an impact on me as a young girl. I said to, to my, well, he was my boyfriend at the time. I said to my, my now husband, do you think we're going we're going to overextend ourselves? Maybe we shouldn't take such a big mortgage. We are young. Maybe we should just kind of pace ourselves a bit. And so we did not end up putting an offer in that house. But that, what he said to me, stayed with me. And I think what you're saying, they're not happy. We overextend ourselves quite often yeah. um, because we think. I guess, I mean, that happens a lot, you know, in, in the UK. Yeah. Where I think these days you are 
a lot of people because when you wanted to borrow and take the mortgage, I guess before you had like three to one lending power. Yeah. Um, but that time, I think the salaries and you know, and interest rate. Yes, interest interest rates were high. Sure. But the salary is still matching that you still can afford yes. to make the repayment yeah. for up to three times, perhaps. Yeah. But these days, I think you can take up to I don't know, combine six more. to nine times. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, when the rates go up now, everyone's having problems because we can't afford it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And it's important. And, and that's. But it's I, I find it such it's, it's such an ethical thing for let's say for the lender to be to be do, doing their part yeah. not to lend the money out. Yeah, yeah. You know, I remember some people came to me and they said, "Pooh, um, so he's he's a lot, um, you know, he's he's older than me." And and um, he said, "In my days, you know, I walk into the estate agents, I walk into the mortgage brokers, and came out with a house." And plus another 10% percen on top. So I got my brand new BMW 325 yeah. um, as well as, as a gift with the house as well. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. so they didn't have to put anything in at all. Yeah. You just went in. They went in, collect the house, yeah. collect the key, and a brand new, you know, Beamers that came with it. It's a business. And how scary! Yep. How scary Thanks is that? Because businesses. you know, a yeah. couple of years down the line, the rates. Have gone up, yeah. and that's when things get tight. You know, kind of do you go get yeah upside down again? So. Yeah, I think it's all all the decisions that we make, and I, you know, we have to be accountable and responsible for every decision that we make that brings us to mm -hmm. the outcomes that we have to experience. So even though, you know, people may get um, depressed or upset because they then have. They're chasing their tail to work for to pay something off. Um, that's a decision that they made, and when you understand mm. that, that you know this was my choice to go in here and do that. And even though the interest rates were different at that time, you know I could have chosen not to do it. I could have looked at that and thought it was going to put me under pressure, just like I thought yep. when I was that young twenty-one year old girl. But we don't. Yeah, it's kind. It's kind of. It, It's kind of connected to, um, you know, I I think that the majority of the world now, especially, well, let's talk about the UK specifically. Yeah. People, most people's lives are a day to day just battle, yeah. right? There's no fun. There's no enjoyment. There's no ambition. Where have vision you been or, living? You know, You've got to come to Australia. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a very yeah. I've lived in Australia. It's a very different place, but but here. <laughs> For most people, it is. It's a daily just kind of battle to survive, yeah. right? Yeah. Day in, day out. And I think people have forgotten that, you know, we've got this one life and life's meant to be for living. It's meant to be for, you know, to have fun. It's meant to be happy. It's meant to be travel, meant to be experience, meant to be community. And why that doesn't happen because, going back to what you were just talking about, society teaches us to go out, leverage up, get the big house, get yep. the car on the finance. And what you end up doing is you create like this huge monster, yep. right? This big ball and chain that you're then dragging Don't through you. life. Then on top of that, you throw in a couple of kids that you can't afford, right? But everyone just pops them out anyway, because that's what we're supposed to do. And you end up creating a life where it's just about survival rather than actually having fun. Yep. So my theory is get rid of all the materialistic shit Work to save money, have a vision, have a, have a plan, like engineer the process, yeah. right? What do I need to get to my, a life which I would determine as being a, you know, a good life, a fun life where we can have experiences and travel and all the rest of it and, and use the money to get there. And then once you're there and you've got that life and you're happy, then say, okay, we're here. Okay. We got here in a quicker time because we didn't have all these other costs that yeah. we couldn't afford. Now let's look, if we can, bringing in this other stuff that maybe we want on top of it. But yeah. it's like people almost go out and with a self-destruct button. And it's yeah. like, what can I do to create the hardest life I can yeah. without thinking about, can we afford it? But that, that's just I think do. that's what you guys are doing with your business model and what you're you know, teaching people is fantastic. Because if you look at, I have you know, friends from all over the world. And one of our closest friends is from Switzerland. And 
he lives six months here and six months there. And we went over when he was living over there and spent two weeks with him. And it, housing properties or any property is so expensive over there that it's unaffordable for anyone. So only the very, very wealthy can afford to purchase a home. So they rent. Most of their lives are spent renting. And that's other European countries as well. So if you ha and Japan, if you have a look at the tourism and who's doing a lot of the traveling, you'll see that they're the countries that people cannot, the average person cannot afford to purchase a property in because the prices are far too high. Uh, so what they do is use their money to travel and see the world. Whereas Australia, for instance, and, and England, I would say would be similar. We, we are brought up to believe that you must, you know, work hard and go and get a mortgage and get a house and get a roof over your head. So we don't spend a lot of money traveling, doing what we could be doing. Whereas what you guys are, I think, offering is, you know, put it into an investment by, you know, by doing your Airbnb and let that pay it off. You don't have to work that hard. You don't have you know, to do all that. You, you kind of let someone else pay that off for you and you can travel i uh, i think i would chip on yeah i think i would jump on that one as well is that uh what's important for us what we what we trying to spread the message is yes um you know we we should be looking for like multiple ways to earn the, the money yeah. rather than just being in a job yeah. but but it's also important to invest into the right assets as well yeah so property but is like for us is one of the the strong Great assets, assets. To, to invest in, yeah. providing providing that you know what to do with it yeah. and the timing of it. Absolutely, that's why. Um, so if you if you buy a house and you know massive house and you lift in yourself, yeah. um, that to like to me is not an asset. Yeah. That's a liability because you got maintenance, you got this, you got that. Yeah. But even if you buy a tiniest place, you know, but that's making you money that for someone else to pay for it, then that becomes your assets. Yeah, absolutely. And it can trickle the incomes in, you know, every month without having to do too much on it. No. Um, and you can do the things that you want. Yeah. So, and it is a matter of, like you were saying, yeah, it's really important for us to give the right information, have the, have it accessible to people so they know where are the hot areas, what, you know, breaking it all down for them. So it's important. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Um, right, Ray, I wanted to, I want to ask you something. Uh, sorry, Alex. I'll, I'll just well, ask you something real quick. So, how how is the <laughs> we want to um, we want to speak to you? Is, and ask I know. Put out the knowledge. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so so when it comes to, to running a business mm. um, yourself, you know, for for a lot of people, yeah. How how do you find like mental health um, affecting these uh, business owners? Yeah. Um, is it is it a big thing for them yeah. or is it just, you know, an, another like get on with it type of things? And, no, what I'm um, finding is... How do we, how like, how do business owners match themselves? Yeah. What I'm finding, especially with a lot of my male clients that have, you know, got big, big companies over in London and England and, you know, they run many, many companies all around the world. They need to have tools, what we call tools. So what I give is tools to help them manage the stress, tools to help them self-regulate, which I've worked a bit, done a bit of work with you, Alex, just to, to know how, yeah. to, how, how the nervous system works, how the brain is working, how to self-regulate so that the stress is not overtaking. What happens is when, as humans, you can be stressed for a certain amount of time and the body can cope with that. But when you extend that stress mm. constantly, you're up front and, you know, kind of confronting the stress, your body cannot cope with it. So when the when you get stressed or you have um, a lot of concerns, worries or overwhelm, for instance, a lot of staff problems, the stress, the cortisol is released and, and it basically lets the amygdala, a part of the brain that governs all our emotions, and is almost like our protector. I always say the amygdala is like the meerkats. You know, the meerkats that are going like that, mm -hmm. danger, danger. Yep. Yep. And the moment that yep. the, you're under stress, it, it will say, danger, I need to help you here. Yep. So what happens is cortisol floods the amygdala, and 
the amygdala then what will happen to your body is your body so your prefrontal cortex totally shuts down and that's where your rational thinking happens so quite often when you're running businesses and you're doing a lot of work the rational part of your brain when you're under stress totally not happening it, it literally shuts yeah. shuts it down because the blood has to pump down to your lower extremities, down to your fingers and down mm. to your feet. And it's doing that because it thinks you're in trouble. And our number one need as a human is survival. So it will go into, we're equipped to survive. So it will go into survival mode, fight or flight. So that's when that's happening, as a manager or running your own business, you can't you're trying to make rational decisions. And it's like we discussed earlier about depression. You don't really know you're in it until someone may point it out to you or you're not getting out, you, you feel yuck. And when that's prolonged, yep. you realize you've got a problem. It's the same thing when you're under constant stress. You may be making um, decisions. Oh, I've lost you. <laughs> Can you still hear me? Yep, you're still oh, here. Yes, okay. yep, still here. Um, you're, you, you, you're the rational part of your brain, the prefrontal cortex in the brain, because that's offline when you've got a lot of stress and the cortisol's kind of flooding it, you can't make rational decisions. So you're making decisions usually out of stress that may not be the right decisions, if that makes sense. 100%. Sorry, and so, what is the, the number one cause of uh, stress that you have come across um, in, in the business owners if do you can do you see like a trend or normally um, something that normally it usually it, generally it's staff problems um it's uh, they have a lot of problems with staffing they get a lot of stress from staffing their problem. that's interesting yeah, yeah, yeah from their ceos from their partners not you know i've done a lot of work with partners in business it's like a marriage and sometimes you're not communicating in the way that you need to. So I will talk to one partner and then I'll talk to another partner and I said, we need to have a joint session so that you can talk together. Um, it's all about lack of communication, being afraid, being afraid of what that person may think of us. So um, there's mm -hmm. lots of different things, but I think business owners in general, if they have the tools and know how to self-regulate, how to de-stress, the brain, it's so important so that they can make decisions from the rational mind and not from that fear factor of survival mind, which is your fight or flight when you're in stress. Yeah. Does that yeah. make sense? <laughs> yeah, it does. Yep. Uh, makes good sense. Yeah. Um, and something else, Ray, that I just want to touch on, which I think is a massive problem uh, today. And I, I know that everyone that's watching or listening this, listening to this will relate is this whole thing around social media. Mm. And, you know, we wake up, you know, me and Pooh have talked about this endlessly. You wake up, you grab your phone. First thing you do is open up Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, all the rest of it. Yep. And immediately you go into comparison mode, yep. right? Everyone's setting the world on fire seemingly easily. You know, everyone's making money. Everyone's good looking, perfect, pretty, successful, happy. And it just sets your whole day on a downer because yeah. you just wake up and you think, well, here I am feeling kind of lost. You know, I've got a massive spot on my chin. Yeah. I'm overweight. Yeah. You know, what's your feelings around that? What's your advice around how we can avoid that? Because that, I believe, is is one of the, the, the roots of most people's problems these days is this comparison, mm. com, com, compar comparing nature that we're, that we're kind of stuck in. So what, how do you get around that? It's First everywhere. of all, I can tell you at, from a therapist's point of view, I see a lot of extremely successful people I, uh, as clients that are big Instagrammers, that are big on, face, on social media. And when I see what they post, I think, wow, I'm always blown away because I know another story and I know another them and I know what's really going on and it's not what they're presenting. So to me, the way I see social media, it's like watching a movie. It's not really real. I, you know, you put on a movie to get lost in it and to kind of think, oh, I don't have to worry about anything because I'll get lost in the movie. 
and it takes you away from what you're thinking and what you're doing. Reality. Yeah. But what we've done is confuse social media as real, as reality, and we have to be like that. It's like going and thinking we have to be like Spider-Man or, you know, James Bond, 007, watching a movie. We, we don't. We're just, it's just entertainment. And I think a lot of people now with social media, and it's just my opinion, you know, um, only because I am a therapist and I do do a lot of work with a lot of people and I see such a huge difference between what they present and what's really going on with them. And I just wish more people would be really authentic um, and show up and say, I feel like crap today. I don't feel good today. I'm, yep. you know, and yep. show that part as well, not just all the fantastic and what they're doing and how they're working out and, you know, like all the hard parts that they actually have as well. So what we're looking at, you do, like you say, there's a comparison, but it's like trying to compare yourself to a movie to actors, to people in a movie, because a lot of the time that's what they're doing. That's what I see mm. anyway. Like yeah. it blows my mind because I I know I know them and I'm working with them on a whole other, another level. And I'm like, oh, that's really interesting that you're you're struggling here and you're doing that, but you would yeah. never know. I mean, that. Isn't that isn't that more difficult, you know, to pretend to be someone else because you have to keep lying on, you know, again and again? It would be for and me. Not, a, not, if, for not if the money is dropping in. Not if, yeah, if not, if, tens of millions not if it's are working in. for yeah. them. Yeah, if it's working for them, I probably guess. not. Yeah. No. Because we, and, I, I sent, I sent um, Poo a, a, a link the other day about, you know, now when you open up your social media, it's the trend is about, you know, it's either the five AM club, or then, it, or the <laughs> in, some people are like the four AM club. There's some three AM clubbers out there, but this this guy, uh, and I think he went viral because it was so ridiculous. And it, and it it might be real. He's quite a well known guy, and he's talking about his morning ritual, and it starts at four, and he's up and out of bed within two seconds, and he's straight into his you know ten minutes of speed reading on times two, and then he's into his meditation, then he's into his workout. Then he's into the detox. Then he's in the ice bath, and then, it, and by the time and then like another two hours comes, of low, weightlifting, <laughs> weightlifting, weightlifting, and then time with his kids, time with his wife, him and his wife together. You know, by the time nine o'clock's rolled around, he's done like a week's worth. And you're listening to it going, and, and, and then the interviewer goes, the interviewer says, "Wow, that's really impressive." So if you're getting up at four, what time do you go to bed? And I'm, I'm, I thought he was going to say, oh, you know, I'm in bed by eight. But he's like, I go to bed about 11. You know, I only need like four hours sleep. No. You know, and I'm good. And it's like, no. I'm like and if that's who people are comparing themselves to, it's like, come on. Yeah. You know, well, that, yeah. that in real. itself, yeah. comparing, you know, that in itself, you just can't do. That's the beauty of us is that we're so unique. We are so individual. You know, there's not one of us ever alike on the planet and you know by the color of our eyes the color of our hair we're just so different and that's the beauty of of us well i think what we're one of what we one of the things of many that we're trying to achieve here on this platform yeah is to bring it just back down to earth a little bit yeah. and say guys you don't need to be like mark Wahlberg and be in the gym at 2 30 every morning but on the other end of the spectrum, you can't wake up at nine, lay in bed on Instagram for an hour and then get up and have a, you know, a, a full English breakfast every day. Mm -hmm. There's a middle ground, which is getting basics, get enough sleep, stay off the booze, yeah. hydrate, food. you know, move your body in the morning, get up at a decent time, not three in the morning, seven, right? Do 30 minutes of moving your body, do some exercise. Like these are just basic things that everybody can do. Mm -hmm. There are no excuses. You can find that 30 minutes. And these little steps do make big differences. It doesn't have to be off the charts, extreme Superman stuff. No, definitely right? not. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Yeah. It's basic things. The, the other day, um, I think when you sent over this, uh, this text, um, the other day I had uh, a really bad sleep because my, my little girl, she had, she's teething at the moment. She's eight months, oh, eight, nice. nine months. Congratulations. And, um, so she was, thank you. So she woke me up. And you know, I was I was upset. I was angry. Or I didn't I didn't feel angry, but I just 
yeah. you did when you didn't get enough sleep yeah. it, it's horrible yeah cranky yeah. um so i got up and uh, i swapped with my wife so my wife went to to sleep with her instead and i could not sleep so i came down and i did the exercise at four in the morning so, <laughs> there you go you're that guy <laughs> that's that's where he goes so so i did i jumped straight out put my gear on i did my exercise at four in the morning i finished by half past four yeah i was knackered i stretched a little bit and i went back to bed fantastic so, <laughs> you, you, know, you tied you yourself out what happened to the i skipped bar? the rest of the routine <laughs> you know, oh, but uh they were walking yeah what again, a seven o'clock so I know. Well, do you know, it's really funny talking about that, getting up and being on social media. For myself with my business, when I started, we didn't have social media. So back in the 80s, you know, as I'm growing up and doing my business, mine was all word of mouth. So when I started into my psychotherapy practice, it was, I'm just going to do word of mouth because how do I advertise? I don't know. You know, it wasn't what we have now. So everything that I have built has been purely by word of mouth. I don't advertise at all. Wow. You won't find me anywhere on social media where it says raise psychotherapy practice or what I do. Uh, it's all or it has all organically grown because people have said you need to see Ray. You need you know as mm. as you know Alex you need to see Ray to see this girl that you know my therapist and it's grown and grown. And so when I tell anyone if they say oh what's your instagram or where is your website i'll go i actually don't have one because i've never needed one i'm busy really busy and yeah. i do that simply because people refer me and i don't ask them to they just it just happens so i now am at a point with my business where i am looking at you know maybe i need to be people keep telling me you need to be out there what are you know people say oh, how can i know more about what you do i have mm-hmm. to have some sort of landing page or something that maybe can show them who i am and what i do but before that it's only ever been word of mouth and i think that's disappeared now it, it has to be for me i think if i have to sell myself to you or tell you how good i am or you know i can do this for you you only have me to believe for that and i know i can do that mm. but i'd love you to hear it from you know your colleague or from you know your friend that says they've experienced it so they know it that to me is a is the greatest way of building a business yeah. but that's changed so i have to change with the times as well and maybe look at how you know i can shift my business as well yep I think with I think with your business yes I agree it's so powerful to have an online presence but I think for me personally anyway I it's such a minefield trying to find a, a therapist or yeah. a mentor or a mindset coach online yeah. because you know it's just it's it's so many there's yeah. so many and 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 probably 80% of that crowd that space you know they did a a week long you know, training course, three day, and they got the certificate. Three and now all of a sudden they're, they're this, you know, so for me, you know, I connected with you through a personal recommendation by someone who I knew, yeah. right. And knew it had results. And then he said, you know, I'm telling him, look, I'm feeling this, that, and the other. And he's like, you need to see Ray. Yeah. Maybe that should be a tagline. You, you need to see Ray. Ray. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I, I think kind of yes and no, like, yeah, you, it's good. You know, if you want to, take your business you know to the absolute through the stratosphere you know and blow up then mm. absolutely online but i think in your specific niche as well word of mouth it's rec- great. personal yeah. recommendations yeah. Is, is big yeah and you i know, and i that's have a real big thing um a lot of thai uh, clients from thailand and they say i they say um you're my ray of sunshine r a e of sunshine oh, and they yeah. say that you need ray i say to my friends you need to have ray in your life you need to have ray in your oh. life and that 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 when you were talking about taglines you need ray in your life is what they were saying yeah. you should have that as your tagline <laughs> yeah. but that's how i work that's that works for me and it's worked for me you know and now i'm i can go all over the world it's just kind of grown mm. organically all over the world and it's been amazing yes Yeah. Yeah. So one one of the things that we um, have been working on with uh, that I've been working on with Ray, I guess, speak to the audience is, um, you know, around other 
uh, emotional stuff, yeah. more business related stuff is like time management, how to structure Prioritizing, things. Prioritizing, yeah. Because, yeah, because I, it's something that I've always struggled with. And again, you end up comparing yourselves to the guys that are up at five and, you know, by nine o'clock, they've achieved more than you have in a week. Um, and you, because I, I find that you, it's so easy to drift yeah. when you don't have structure. Yeah. And for me, coming from a, an employee, a life as an employee yeah. to now a business owner with Life Beyond Broke and our Airbnb portfolio, you know, I think Pooh's a lot better at it than I am. He'll probably disagree, but he's got a lot more structure. But I tend Not to drift. Really. If, I, if I, yeah, see, I knew it. Not with an eight, if, eight month if, old. If I, <laughs> no. No. Blows structure but out. But I need. Order. I need yeah. a, a process yeah. and you've, you've helped a lot with that, putting in some real like tangible steps. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of people that have the same issues. So, yeah. so if you can, why don't you talk about a little bit around, you know, just in general, some recommendations you might have for people that find that all of a sudden it's six o'clock and it's, they're like, I haven't done anything. I haven't done anything. Well, basically if we, for me, whenever I'm working the client and I have put together a module and I haven't released it yet, but it's the re called the reset method and it works with nine modules and we try and work as, as us humans do uh, without really knowing who we are. We think we know who we are, but really we don't know who we are on a deep, deep level. And we try, it's like building a house without a really strong foundation and without a blueprint as to know which way to go and how to navigate this. So the first thing I do is work with the blueprint of each of my clients, meaning get your blueprint right and you can take your life and whatever you get to know yourself, what's important. You can get to know then where you want to take your life and how you operate best. And the blueprint is simply what are your values, what are your morals and what are your boundaries? You work with your boundaries around that. When you know that, then you can understand why you react instead of respond. Why, for instance, myself, one of my values is I really value punctuality and I value reliability. So when people say they're going to do something and they let me down, I it re I really get upset. You know, not like someone else may not get as upset as I do. I get upset simply because it's important to me. I would not that's important to me. That's a value of mine. So you can know people that know me. I'm always on time for our sessions. You are. <laughs> you are. <laughs> um, people that know me know that if I say I'm going to do something, they can be certain I will get it done. You know, I, and that's with work as well, like right? businesses, whatever. If you're going to do it, show up and do it. But there are other people that's not a value to. And so as I started unfolding and doing work on myself, a long time, no, not that long ago, no, a long time ago, I also realised that um, what was important to me and who I was allowed me then to be more empathetic and compassionate to others where I wasn't being triggered as much. So the people that were letting me down, it, that was a value to me. So then I understood, well, it's not important to them, so I have to understand not to rely on them for anything really important because you know they're going to be an hour late or they're going to not bring what they said they're going to bring. So you, you start to, when you know who you are and what is important to you, you can then take full responsibility for that rather than get mad at the person who's let you down or mad at that person that, you know, doesn't show up when they say they've got an appointment to show up. You know, to me it's lack of respect and that's important to me as well but it may not be important to them. So when you have your blueprint, right. okay, you have, you know, you know who you are, you know your values, you know, you start to understand that oh, that's why that really frustrates me. That's why I get so angry with that because that's important to me, but it may not be important to them. So you understand who they are, you understand who you are, and you surround yourself with the people you can rely on with that'll be punctual or to say what they're going to do and do it. That to me is, is where I sit now. I don't tend to get really frustrated or if I do, I take note of it. Mm. And it's not like, you know, mad, get mad at them, but just go, okay, that that's who they are. They, obviously their values don't align with mine, 
And it's the same with companies when you're working for big corporations or companies um, or your own business, is to make sure that when you're surrounding yourself with people, that they are in alignment with where you're heading or with um, your similar values or similar morals. And it's, I say all the time to couples or to people looking for relationships, don't fall in love with looks, don't fall in love with how they look or how they make you feel giddy or you know excited. Fall in love with the character of the person, their values and their morals. Because if you have that similar, you'll go the distance. And I think that's why my husband and myself have lasted, for, we've been married 40 years, um, as long as we have, because we have very similar morals and values as to who we are. So we don't rub up against each other, you know, like push back on each other because we are so far apart with that. So um, that's really important to sort of have that. And you build from that in really getting to know who you are. So in your with your question or what you were stating, Alex, like how do you get people to um, change that maybe or not procrastinate? Basically, because the way we work as humans, our brain is wired to always head towards what's familiar, the path of least resistance. It's like we get up, we learn repetitively how to tie our shoelace. We don't have to get up every day and think, oh, how do you tie a shoelace again? How do I put my key in the ignition and change those. We've done it enough times, we don't have to think about it. So the brain has already started that neuro pathway that's that's already been carved out that we just know how to do it. You know, we don't have to think how to drive to work or to our mum's house every day because we've done it enough times that we're, you know, on automatic pilot. So with um, when we procrastinate or when we're not getting things done, it's because we've created a habit and we're habit forming and we don't have to think about it too much we're just doing what we know we always do the only way to change that up is by making the unfamiliar familiar and that is starting to create new habits new ways of doing but you have to be committed you have to kind of really focus and and like I've said to you, Alex, one small step every day, just one thing. Don't try and cram a new habit or new things like going to the gym and, you know, going full out, trying to get that six pack or those muscles built. And it's not going to happen like that. Go steady, just, you know, bit by bit and you'll build up. It's the same with changing anything like procrastination or a habit that you've formed. It's like, okay, being very aware, I'm realising I'm doing this. What can I do different? What can I do right now to change that up? You know, it might be just get up, stand up, move around your desk, go and take a few breaths, take a glass of water, just change what you're doing. Your physiology is really important in making changes as well as your mental state and being aware. So it's little simple things that you can do to create the change and it, it means um, actioning taking putting things into action and creating some new habits it takes a while don't beat yourself up you know 21 days they say to create a new habit so just every day doing something you know that you want that takes you closer to where you want to go does that did that make sense <laughs> i think it i think it has to become a, a like almost like a lifestyle ray right it does it absolutely to, you've got to want it you've got to put the discipline in place yep. and then yep. in order to maintain that routine that discipline that's where all the other stuff in the background comes in like yeah. you know not drinking 10 beers every yeah. night because you're going to wake up late and you're not going to exercise and then yeah. you're going to and then it's just a slippery slope so it's all the background stuff and then really wanting to do it and then just yeah building and that routine the other thing um, that's really but it is you're right familiarity familiarity is, is, is a big yeah. thing. the path of least resistant we're habitual creatures so we're going to do that where we don't have to overthink too much or put in the effort to to learn when we have to learn something new or we have to make changes then with fear we're fear driven because when we don't know an outcome we don't know what's ahead and what the outcome will be we kick into fear, we kick into worry, which is all about control. And when we can't control the outcome to get exactly and know exactly how we want it, um, we usually go into that fear state and and the stress starts and we stop doing what we started doing. So, yeah, it does take commitment. 
The other thing, I don't know how, how long we've got, but if I could take you guys and your listeners through a really quick, um, kind of like a semi, not even meditation, but it's a semi-breath uh, meditation, I would love you to understand how powerful you actually are because we talk about the mind is so powerful, we hear it, but I until you feel it and experience it, you really don't know. And I, what I would love you to do is to understand that your body, your physical self, doesn't know what's real. It only knows what you tell it. So part of what you're telling yourself, those same stories as to why you're not getting up and, you know, or, or kind of doing what you're meant to be doing, your body doesn't know. So it does what you're telling it to do. And when you become aware of what you're telling it to do and want to change it, it's all part and parcel. You need to be really aware of what your mind is kind of filtering and absorbing down into your body and your body goes, I, I, so let's get on to that and we'll listen and do exactly and you'll align with that behaviour. So would you mind if I just quickly took you through a little example of how you can feel what I'm that talking about? That would be amazing. About? Yeah? That would be okay. fantastic. Right? So yeah. while you're sitting there, right. and so if your listeners want to follow along and do it with us, if you just get comfortable and sit comfortably, don't stand, don't operate any heavy machinery, just um, sitting and taking. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to close your eyes for me. And I'm going to count you into a three sequence breath, which is breathing in through your nose for four and breathing out for six. And the moment you begin, it's a self-regulation tool that you can use. The moment you're getting stressed or upset, self-regulate your body by breathing out longer, taking the exhale longer than the inhale. It's a, it sends a signal to the brain that you're safe and you can relax. So breathing in for four through your nose, one, two, three, Breathing out through your mouth. One, two, three, four, five, six. Breathing in through your nose. One, two, three, four. Breathing out. One, two, three, four, five, six. Breathing in. One, two, three, four. Breathing out. One, two, three, four, five, six. Good. Just keeping your eyes closed and just being aware of your breath and slowing it down slightly and deepening that breath slightly and just allowing your whole body to still, your mind to still, forgetting about everything other than this moment right now. Just checking in with your body, just allowing it to totally relax. Allowing your jaw to drop away from the top teeth so your teeth aren't touching, just relaxing. Now I want you to imagine that you are seeing the most beautiful sunset that you've ever seen. Just try and bring it into as much visualization as you can. Imagine your favorite flower, the smell, color. Your favorite car, the way it feels when you drive it, the way it smells. And now I'm going to ask you to imagine there's an elevator door in front of you. And the elevator opens and you step inside and you notice without touching any of the buttons it's automatically going up to the 70th floor 70 floors it's a huge building you're in now and you can feel yourself in this elevator going up going up even higher really really high and as the elevator reaches the 70th floor, you feel as the door opens, the air changes. And as you step out, you step out onto a balcony. I want you to turn right. And as you walk this balcony, 
you begin to notice that there are no railings up ahead. So you have to be really, really careful. You're up high, you can feel the wind. There are no railings. There is a wall, but one of the balconies has no railing. And I want you to stop for a moment and just look out. And if you can, just walk as close as you can to the edge of that balcony with no railings, knowing you're up high. Be very, very careful. Have a look around. You feel like you're on top of the world, but you know you have to be careful. There's no safety here. I want you now to step back away from the edge, back closer to the wall. I want you to turn back the way you came towards that elevator door. The door is still open and I want you to go back inside the elevator. And as the door closes, you feel a sense of relief. You're safe. And the elevator now descends back down through all the floors, taking you down, further down. And this time, as the elevator door opens at the ground level, there is a really mean dog standing there looking at you. And you know, if you go out, you take the risk this dog not liking you seems upset and you don't know whether just to stay because this dog begins to notice you and starts growling the owner now comes along and takes the dog away it's safe for you now to leave the elevator And to feel yourself just still sitting in the seat in your room. And I want you to imagine the laugh, the giggle of a child. How they just laugh and giggle so freely and it makes you almost giggle. I want you to think of your favourite person or your favourite animal and how that fills you up with so much love. And now I want you to feel yourself coming back into the room where you're sitting, feeling your toes and your fingers, just taking a nice deep breath. And when you're ready, open your eyes. Good. And what I want to ask you both is, how did that feel going up in the elevator, standing on the ledge without the balcony? I could really feel I could really feel the wind and the, the cold air and I had a really clear view in my mind yeah. when I was standing on the top of the building. Yeah, when I was scary too. And, sorry, Pooh, how about yourself? Um I felt a bit uh hazy. Um because I felt a lot of resistance in my mind. Yeah. Um that's so I think what what I found really amazing was um, to be in the moment and then to be aware of the, your breathing in and out. Um, but I can still I can still feel a lot of tension and a lot of um, 
what's it called like it's the urge to resist yes um yeah. to restrain and um so i do feel but then i'm i'm slowly you know following through the steps yeah um and it feels it feels lighter but there's still a lot of resistance inside so so when i was asking um, you to but i'm just following yeah when i was asking you to yeah. imagine your favorite flower or the sunset could you how did that feel just in me asking you to do that alex what, what do you think i it felt relaxing i mean i could see the sunset it was like a pink and orange mix yeah and I was in a place that was familiar to me, somewhere where I used to work, a really beautiful place. And uh, and I could see the flower, I could feel it, I could smell it. Yeah. So it was, it was really clear, <laughs> sorry. clear for me. Oh, I'm sorry. There's the things that went through my, my head was, um, I, I followed the steps, but um, mine was different. Sometimes I could not see. Yes. A lot um, of people can't visualize. Like I saw when you asked me to... When you asked me this to picture, uh, let's say the aggressive dog, what came out was a Snoopy dog. So. <laughs> Something so not aggressive. <laughs> you just did not want to go there. I'm not putting it's myself in danger. <laughs> no, and and when you asked me to, um, like, to you know, to be on top of the the, the building, the world, uh, what's in my head was was like. Um, Sorry, it's gonna sound really bad, <laughs> but it's like you, you, you have you watched like a Frozen movie? A Frozen, yeah, um, yeah, I have. On the top of Elsa to, to castle, yes, yes. yes. So top of the, the like the Elsa the castle, yes, yeah. And then quickly, oh, you're a little it's, princess. Hold on, hold on. It's not it's not done yet. And then quickly, it switched to Game of Thrones. Wow! When you stood on the wall. Wow. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> So, so in well, that, that one out, right? I know. <laughs> Gosh, I'd love to get into your brain. <laughs> so, with, with oh my goodness, <laughs> with that, what I want to ask you again? But sorry, but I, I, yeah, yeah, go on. Mm -hmm. Sorry, so I, but I try to to kind of refocus back, um, just on the breathing itself, um, which kind of calm, calms kind of you calm, down, close the mind down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what was happening with your body when all that happened? When you were thinking of the nice things, your body would have felt lighter, your breathing would have been stable, correct? Or not? Mm. Yeah. But then when I asked you to go up and uh, no safety. I, I, I felt relaxed. I felt yeah. relaxed. But then when I asked you to go where there's no safety, to be careful of the balcony, did you find that your body shifted? Or did you feel any sensations in your body? Not phys not physical different. I mean, I mean, you know, in the in the place I was in, you know, I was aware of it and I was aware of the danger, and I was, you know, I didn't want to get too close, so I was really in it. So your breathing well, would have I, changed I for me slightly. Because, I mean, there was sorry. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, you're gonna yeah, say. I something. think for me because it was the sense of of resisting in some way in my brain. Yeah. Um. So I personally, I, I didn't feel it too much um, in that case. Yeah. Because there were, uh, like throughout the whole, my whole life have been brought up in a way that I have to be in control the whole time. Yes, yeah. Everything that I have to do, you know, it's got to be in control. Yeah. So I felt, sometimes I felt I want to break free from that, but I don't know how. Yeah. So um, letting... this is the thing where like even to, you know, to imagine something, there's always safety nets yeah. inside my brain yeah. um, because it's inbuilt. Yeah. And sometimes I wanted to, to just let that go. Yeah. So, well, um, the, the purpose of what I just, well, guys, I'm just took you through, just quickly, the purpose of what I just took you through yeah. was yeah. You, I was watching both of you. You didn't move. You weren't on that building. You weren't, there was no Snoopy dog or no dog. But your body didn't know that. So what happens is that's how powerful, if you understand what we're visualising, what we're thinking and what we're taking in has an impact on us, whether it's resistance, I can't go there, I don't feel safe, or whether it's I can go there and feel it, but it, but you, you were not there, you were here, but you could really feel it. So the body in that moment did not know that you weren't there. It just was there with you. 
and sometimes your breathing will change or you're going up to the edge of that thing. I've had women say, mm -hmm. my whole tummy dropped. I could feel like a tummy drop. I felt so scared. People didn't like going in an elevator. Oh, I was really scared in the elevator. My heart was going. So your, your, your physical reaction is happening even though you're not there. That is how amazing. When you want to make changes, you want to change habits, that's where you have to start. I just wanted you to understand what's yeah. happening and why we're how we're so powerful. The process, yeah. Mm. yeah. So become aware. Thank you, Thank you so much for that, Ray. My pleasure. I know we've gone way over. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, well, no, it's, no, it's, no. it's such an amazing subject and there's so much to it and there's so much, you know, knowledge and, and, and stuff that you can bring. So that's why we want to have you as an integral part of the, of the, of this program. And, you know, with your, you know, agreement hopefully you know you can be a an ongoing kind of you know wealth of knowledge that can help yeah sure help our people and our, and our followers to just grow in so yeah. many different ways so we're going to put in the show notes all of your contact information okay um which you haven't got any online presence no. at the minute so they can send you a letter <laughs> yeah or, or, give you or they can <laughs> my phone number but, they um, can you will have or my email I can give you my email yes, and they yep. can um, email, email, email me if they want to know yep. any more information about what I do. Yeah. That'll be fantastic. And even what so, I would like to yeah, do. I guess that brings us to the. Maybe in a further, a further yeah. episode, I could um, allow your listeners or give them a reset technique, which is a breath work that I do as well. And um, I can send it to you that and be your um, read or your listeners could access yeah. that. Yeah. We'd love that. Amazing. We'd love that. Okay. Ray, thank you so much for coming on. My pleasure. Uh, so glad that I found you. And yeah, amazing. I'm glad amazing, you found uh, me too. <laughs> amazing, amazing time. Oh, cool. Well, it's lovely. Alrighty. It's lovely meeting you, Prue. And it's been great, Alex. And I'll thank see you, so you next time. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And we will see you next week for the next Airbnb Nomad podcast. Take care. See you soon. Bye.